We are now in a position to use the production possibility frontier as a means of illustrating certain terms in macroeconomics. When the productive capacity of the economy expands over time, we can think of that growth in productive capacity as being an outward movement of the production possibility frontier. So in this diagram, we have services on the vertical axis and we have goods on the horizontal axis. And when the productive capacity of the economy increases, that is to say when there is economic growth, the way in which we represent that is by an outward shift in the production possibility frontier. So if before the spurt in economic growth took place, we were operating at an output defined by X0, which is to say we were producing a goods level G0 and a services level S0. The fact that we have economic growth and therefore a growth in the capacity of the economy means that it is possible for us to produce more of one of the goods or perhaps more of both of the goods. If the economy was originally choosing to produce at the point X0 along its production possibility frontier and now decides after the spurt in economic growth to produce at the combination G and S given by S by X1, we can see that more goods and more services are capable of being produced in this economy after economic growth, just as we would anticipate. So, to summarize, economic growth or an increase in the available resources can be portrayed or envisaged as an outward shift in the production possibility frontier from its original location PPF0 to its new location PPF1. And with the new production possibility frontier, the economy can clearly produce more in both sectors than it could have with the original production possibility frontier. The production possibility frontier can also be used to illustrate what we mean by a recession and a boom in a graphical context. We all know what an economic recession is. In an economic recession, output falls. And more technically, output falls below the economy's capacity output level. In a boom, on the other hand, we know that we have a period of high economic growth. And a boom is to be distinguished from the more normal concept of economic growth by saying that a boom is a period of high growth that raises the output above the normal capacity level of the economy. We will explain what this means momentarily. Here we have, once again, our concave production possibility frontier. We suppose that the economy produces goods and services, and these two products are represented on the two axes of the diagram. We suppose that the economy is initially at the point X here, and that it is producing an amount G0 of goods and an amount S0 of services. In a recession, what happens is that our output potential, our productive capacity declines, and consequently, we may move from a point such as X to a point such as Z, and that point Z illustrates that less of both goods will be produced in the recession. An economic expansion or growth or boom may drive capacity above its normal level to a point such as W. So we can think of booms and recessions as being representable by contractions of the production possibility frontier or expansions of the production possibility frontier. But what does productivity really depend upon? The productivity of labor is discussed constantly in our news media. It is natural to think of the productivity of labor as reflecting how hard people work. But in fact, the productivity of labor reflects 
much more than that. Some labor is more productive than others for a variety of reasons. First of all, if individuals develop skills and knowledge, or if they develop experience, they are more valuable members of the labor force, and consequently, they are more productive. Knowledgeable workers who are problem solvers, who are able to write reports, who have interpersonal skills, workers who have many years of experience in the labor force are capable of producing a higher value output than, in, than individuals who do not have these skills. So the productivity of labor is not simply something that depends upon how hard people work. It depends very much on their accumulated skill, knowledge, and experience. The productivity of labor also depends on the type of capital that they are working with. When we speak of capital in this context, we are referring to physical cap capital. So buildings, machinery, equipment, information technology, software, and so forth. The productivity of labor is not independent of the environment in which that labor is operating. If labor is operating with more up-to-date machinery, cleaner buildings, newer technology, then that labor will be much more efficient than labor that is working with older technology, less efficient machinery, and not as much capital in general. So we should not think of pro the productivity of labor as simply reflecting how hard individuals work. The productivity of labor depends upon a whole host of influences, such as the capital they work with, and their accumulated experience and knowledge. Finally, what do we mean by full employment? Can we use the concept of the production possibility frontier to explain what we mean by full employment? Or another way of framing the same question is to say, when we have a production possibility frontier function for the economy, are we assuming that there is actually a zero unemployment rate in the economy? Well, the answer is no. We are not assuming there is a zero unemployment rate in the economy when we plot the economy-wide production possibility frontier. At the present time, in 2012-2013, the unemployment rate in Canada is in excess of 7%. However, if you asked um, an economist what their belief was regarding the full employment definition of the economy, most economists would say, well, full employment corresponds to having an unemployment rate in the region of 5 or 6 percent. So how can it be that we have such seemingly high unemployment if that is what we think of as being full employment? One way to think of full employment as corresponding to a 6% unemployment rate is to think of the economy in dynamic terms. Even within any urban or metropolitan area, what happens in the labor market and what happens in the economy at large is that some businesses are growing, some businesses are contracting. Businesses that are contracting, businesses that fail, businesses that close or cut back have to lay off their employees. Those employees then become unemployed and they have to search for another job, even if other jobs are available in the economy, even in their own local economy. So it is quite normal in a dynamic economy that individuals who are laid off will experience a period of unemployment before they take on a new job. Another description of the same dynamic process is to think of unemployment taking place in one region of the economy and to think of employment growing in a different region of the economy. If we look back on the economic history of Canada over the last several decades, we would find that some regions of the economy grew more quickly than other regions, 
and these differential growth rates have not been constant decade after decade. So, for example, suppose it's the case that uh, Region X is experiencing a decline in its economy and individuals are becoming unemployed, but Region Y is a growth center and Region Y is looking for people to go work there. Well, it will take a certain amount of time before people move from Region X to Region Y. So it is natural, because of the frictions that exist in the labor force, for people to be unemployed for specific periods of time. And this is one reason why it is quite normal or it is quite natural to have an unemployment rate in the neighborhood of 5 or 6%, even though the economy is producing at its capacity output.